can you tell me just sort of what were the origins of this film and, and why you want to tell this story? It started uh, as a regional TV programme. Um, what happened was I'd moved to Nottingham, uh, my partner is from Nottingham, and there's a guy there who was uh, starting a, a TV channel called Not TV, one of the new Freeview channels. And I'd just finished a film called Svengali and I'd moved to Nottingham. And uh, he said to me that he thought the story of the Forest Double European Cup winning team was a better story than The Class of 92, which was a very popular DVD, good film. And he said to me, would I be interested in doing something on that for the channel? And I said, I'd be interested, so certainly. So I started doing it. But I realised about three weeks in, it was a much bigger story and it needed a bigger platform. So I just sort of said to him, look, shall I take what I've done so far to uh, Baby Cow, a big production company? And he said yes, and they took it on. And they said, let's make it into a feature film. And then that's what we did. We made it into a feature film and we got a lot of distribution offers and it became a much bigger thing, a movie really. Um, and that's where it started. And it took about 18 months. The, the team were quite geographically spread out all over Europe and they were all still alive, thankfully. Um, but I really want to get them to talk because the, the two other main characters, Peter Taylor and Brian Clough, obviously passed away. Mm -hmm. And there's been a lot of films and books made about Brian Clough. It's almost a cottage industry around his life. But what I thought was, I was a huge fan of a documentary called When We Were Kings about Muhammad Ali. And that really concentrated on him fighting Fraser and Foreman in that period, about three or four years when he was at his peak. And I felt Brian Clough, I would love to do sort of 75 to 80, which was him at his prime, really. Uh, and that's what I did. And I wanted to speak to the players and one of Brian Clough's family said to me that you, they, they spent more time with him than him, than they did. So I wanted to speak to the people who were there every day, hour and hour, and find out a little bit what the man was about and, and what it was that made them and him successful. And, and that's what I did. I spoke to the 16 players that were in the 1975 European Cup winning squad. Because, um, you, you mentioned sort of um, that it, it was the players. Did the Clough family have much involvement in that at all? No, they didn't have any involvement in the film and how it was made and what it was made about, but I wanted them to see it. Uh, and I, ha I asked the Clef and Taylor family to come into Nottingham, and I was just there in the room with them. I remember being about five minutes in, thinking, I can't believe I'm sitting here with them all. I wonder what they'll think, the grandchildren were there and the children. Uh, at the end, they kind of hugged me, really. They just said, you know, thank you for making it. Um, but I wanted, I wanted their blessing, certainly, because I can remember actually thinking, what if somebody made a film about my father? How would I feel about that, you know? So, but I, I tried to tell the truth. There was two things the players said to me that were really, really interesting, I thought. They all said that they'd never seen him drunk. He liked to drink. Now, he had massive problems with alcohol later, well documented, and there's no doubt, you know, it was a tragedy what happened in his later life. But in that period when he was at his prime, they'd never seen him drunk. And the other thing was that he ruled by fear. They all talk about the fact that he was actually very funny and created an atmosphere of you know, positivity, like John Robertson famously said, you can't do anything when you're afraid. So I wanted to dispel those myths, really, explode them. Uh, and that's what I was able to do, because the players all talk in the film brilliantly and engagingly about an atmosphere that was created where they were encouraged to do things, encouraged to go forward, encouraged to pass the ball. You know, so I wanted to sort of try and get under the skin, in a sporting sense, certainly, of what it was that made him tick and what it was beyond the kind of what we know of Clough, which is this guy who's got an amazing, huge personality and you know, supremely charismatic and telegenic, all those things. But I wanted to find out what it was that made him hugely successful at that time as well, and, and that's what I tried to do. Do you think, you, you mentioned the cottage industry that, that's sort of around mm. his life, and obviously there's the statue in Nottingham as well, but do you think he's actually ever got the recognition he deserves? I probably don't think he's got the recognition he deserves in the sense of how good he was in, in many respects. I mean, there's so many things I found out as I sort of really dug into it. Like, their win average in Europe was better than Manchester United's greatest ever win average over two years, which is when they won the triple. Manchester United was about 68%, Forest was 79%. So when he was in Europe, he was only playing champions. Every game was like, you know, knockout rounds, and he won, you know, two European Cups. So I was... I was fascinated by actually how successful he was and that maybe what he became and how he became this guy that, you know, hit supporters on the pitch and just, you know, sort of pontificate on television all the time about, you know, current affairs, not just football, had overshadowed slightly what he'd achieved on the football pitch as well and, and all those records that he broke with a team that were playing in the top flight of British football and playing the best team in Europe all the time, which was Liverpool. So he did it, you know, you know he ticked every box and I thought, what was really interesting about him as well, I read every book on him, but when he got to about 1981-82, he'd won the title of a derby when he was in his 30s. He'd won the European Cups by the time he was my age, mid-40s. And it was almost like the progression naturally was then to take the England job. He'd kind of done everything really domestically. 
Um, and I didn't have that Ferguson drive of going, every year I want to win this again. He kind of got bored a bit easy, Brian Clough did. So he wanted the England job, and he never got it. So lesser men, a bit like Muhammad Ali who had his belt taken off him, lesser men stopped him fulfilling his destiny, which was, and I think there was a kind of, almost like an epic sadness to that as well, where, you know, you kind of can see where somebody should have had a job, and I'm Welsh, so it was easy for me to say it. You'd go, why didn't he get that job and that great interview with the lovely Bobby Robson, Sir Bobby Robson, saying, when he was offered the job in 82, say into the English FA, why aren't you giving this to Brian? You know, this should be Brian's job now. But he wasn't allowed to have it because he was so anti-authority, which is something that makes him so attractive to football fans and us all. The fact that he you know, cocked a snoop at blokes in blazers, we loved that. You know, he was getting banned almost every week. You know, he was up on a charge. So you know, all those things kind of made him fascinating to me as a manager. I mean, I think there's been more successful managers like Sir Alex Ferguson is, a, is, a, is probably the most successful football manager in British terms ever, but he was not as charismatic as Brian Clough, not as interesting um, because of Brian Clough's fallibility. I think that's what made him more interesting. He was kind of like, you could recognise something yourself in him. It's a great story actually that, that they were telling me that when he gave the fan a clip on, on the pitch, uh, his family were telling me that he got home that night and his wife Barbara didn't, like, didn't want to hear about football, she wasn't interested. And he kind of gets into bed and he kind of goes, oh, I've really messed up tonight. She kind of goes, oh, you've, you're always saying this. And he kind of goes, no, no, I've really messed up. And it's like such a conversation you have with your missus. And she goes to him, Brian, you live your life in a state of permanent crisis. <laughs> 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 Which is something like my missus would say to me. And it was Brian Clough. So he, and in the morning he woke up and she'd go, oh, God, what have you done this time? But it's, it's kind of like he was like, he had the same things that, were, that seemed epic to us. But they were just things that were happening to a bloke, really, you know. And I loved that about him, that he kind of, he, he felt like us, really. But he was a genius. That was the thing. I think it's just it's easy to mention the film is going to be massively popular with, um, you know, Nottingham Forest fans. Yeah. But the film has so much wider appeal than that. I think mm. that it, it's it's got a yeah mass appeal. Were you sort of conscious about creating a film that had a balance between sort of something for the fans, but something that was much more sort of universal than what it was talking about? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to, I wanted because it's such a great story, the under, the underdog. We all love that story. It's kind of like one of the great stories in you know human history really and, and there was no, no better example certainly in a sporting sense a team sporting sense than what they did because he took an unfashionable club from the mid middle of the second division and won European Cups you can kind of you expect the Manchester United and the Real Madrid to do it you know because they're great clubs traditionally and have been for like a century a lot of them whereas with Forest they kind of like came from nowhere and they kind of had a feeling that anybody could do it if they did it you know and it was kind of he'd done it at Derby and he'd done it there and it was kind of there was a magic to that I think that you know, is special to him and special to that story. I, and as soon as, as soon as I started doing the film, I was finding a lot of stuff in archive, in tins, and it hadn't been seen for 35 years, the old ATV, which was like an old ITV region for the Midlands, and they would go in, I was finding the footage, and then when I found the disco and funk and soul, worked really well to it. That was my kind of like road to Damascus moment, really. And I don't know why it worked so well, but it did. Um, and then that's when I realized there's a great story here because the footage, the music, and I think with disco as well, there was something otherworldly about disco. It was a start of club culture, and you went in, and there was a glitter ball, and there was champagne, but you lived in like a grey working class town. And I think there was a bit of that with this Forest team, is that, you know, they came from, and they were doing things like, John Robertson says a great story that he says, I played York away in 76 or 77, just before they went up, and they lost. And he said, by 1980, I was on a, a jet going to Tokyo to play in the World Club Final Championship, and Queen were on the same jet. That's how the trajectory was of how his life changed. Clough brought, brought that to him and I think that's what's the universal story is how you go this happened and then you go end up here very very quickly. And you, you mentioned the music which yeah. obviously brings so much to it but then there's these little clips every now and again the dad's army. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just wondered sort of how you decided upon them and things like that. I just that. wanted to make it more filmic. I was a massive fan of Julian Temple, who does that brilliantly, obviously. So I was, I was aware that I was thinking, if you add colour and bring reference points to it, cultural refer reference points especially, because it was, wasn't long after the war either. So there's a great line where Ian Bowie goes, it was, it was England, Germany. And it's a big laugh because I just cut to a German soldier, which is ridiculously obvious, but everybody roars laughing because everybody forgets it was almost like a patriotic duty at that time to support the British team in Europe. It doesn't happen now. People wouldn't support Chelsea you now or Manchester City because it's changed. It's, you know, quite rightly long time in the past and money. But then, when I was a kid, it was like, you have to support the English team or you have to support the Scottish team or the Welsh team because that's what we did. It was like, we were British, <laughs> there was Europe. And it was, it was a wonderful naivety to that. And I wanted to get that in the film, really. And 
just lastly, what was the experience of the premiere like? It was it was an amazing premiere. I'd I was talking about this the other day. The Trent end was full, and we walked out onto the pitch, and I was with the team, and we were in the we were in the changing room, and they were all shouting, "Pass it to John Robertson," which was the famous line they used to say, and Cleff used to say it. And then we walk, when we walked out onto the pitch, the, the fans clocked us, and they all started cheering. I don't know if it's an energy or whatever, but the the love that was coming off the stand, I was like, "Wow, this is amazing!" And then, but the team was so comfortable with that. They were so comfortable. They just like that's what that's what we did. That's what we used to do. But I was a bit like, "Wow." That's Fantastic, you know. I thought to myself, that's what rock stars must be like. I thought, no wonder Bono was a bit bonkers, because if you've got that every night in front of 50,000 people, no wonder you could think it could change the world. Do you know what I mean? That was just 4,000 all standing. I was thinking, that's why people behave how they do <laughs> if they're superstars, which is fair enough, but it was brilliant. And you know, the people who were there loved it. It was a six minute stand innovation. It was, I was playing it to Nottingham Forest, you know, fanatics, so I couldn't go wrong really. But it was it was a wonderful reaction. But then when the film went out, as you said, in London it was full of Glasgow because I think that team and that man had a certain resonance with sports fans, certainly football fans, and uh, across the country people remembered that side. I think some teams stay in in the consciousness of football fans. Real Madrid in the 50s, the white kit, Barcelona probably recently, Celtic in the mid 60s, Forest are one of those teams. We all remember that side that came from nowhere and had no business winning the European Cup but won it twice. So I think that's what the appeal was. Awesome. No worries. Thank you very much. Very welcome. No problem.